friends, welcome to First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. I am Pastor Sue Collar, and I am so glad you're spending this time with us today. If this is your first time with us, please text hello to the number on the screen. We would love to connect with you and find out more about you, give you a chance to find out more about us. A couple things before we dive into worship. Last week, we had two new classes started, Bible 101 and Short Stories of Jesus. Both of those are great classes if you are wanting to grow in your understanding of Scripture and learn how to listen to God speak to you through that. So look on our website, click on the Events tab. You'll find both of those classes listed there. You'll find out everything you need to know. And then the first Thursday of October, I'm leading a peer support group called Healing Moral Injury. Moral injury uh, is those things either we've done or others have done that we have been subjected to or witnessed that, that violate our deep sense of, of who we are, of what is right and what is wrong. Uh, again, sometimes we have done those things that have violated our moral code and sometimes others have done things to us. This support group is an opportunity to begin healing those injuries. And so if this speaks to you, again, go to our website, click the events tab, and it'll tell you everything you need to know about that. Okay. As we turn to worship today, we're gonna to be talking about Moses. Moses was a Hebrew slave who was raised as an Egyptian prince got into trouble and ran away from Egypt out into the wilderness, found a second career as a sheep herder, and then God called him away from his sheep back to Egypt to lead God's people into freedom. No small task. And it almost got the better of him. We have all had times where the task has been more than we can handle. But we give it our best anyway because that's what we're supposed to do. Failure is not an option. I'm going to here to tell you, though, that maybe succeeding isn't all that it's cracked up to be. And maybe failure can be something we could learn from. After all, we worship a God who said, my strength is made perfect in weakness. So we're going to talk about our weaknesses and how God meets us. But before we do that, let's come before God in prayer. God of wisdom, God of love, God of mercy, God of grace, be with us this day as we worship. Be present in our hearts as we try to find the words to express to you what we're thinking and feeling. And speak to us that we might hear your word of life, especially in those moments when we are feeling weak and helpless and insecure or not competent enough. Let us find in you our hope. Amen. Friends, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it.
So the Israelites have been freed from slavery in Egypt, and they spent the next 40 years complaining about being freed from slavery in Egypt. I'm glad I was not charged with leading them like Moses was. I don't know that I would have handled it any better than he did. Moses had a difficult role, and he had a lot to learn about being a leader, and even more to learn about how to be a healthy, uh, a healthy person in leadership. As Betty reads the story, ask how you would have handled the situation if you were Moses. The rabble among them had a strong craving, and the Israelites also wept again and said, If only we had meat to eat. We remember the fish we used to eat in Egypt for nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but this manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their families, all at the entrances of their tents. Then the Lord became very angry, and Moses was displeased. So Moses said to the Lord, Why have you treated your servant so badly? Why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all these people on me? Did I conceive all these people? Did I give birth to them? That you should say to me, Carry them in your bosom, as a nurse carries a suckling child, and to the land that you promised on oath to their ancestors. Where am I to get meat to give all these people? For they come weeping to me and say, Give us meat to eat. I am not able to carry all these people alone, for they are too heavy for me. If this is the way you are going to treat me, put me to death at once. If I have found favor in your sight, and do not let me see my misery. So the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy of the Israel of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them. Bring them to the tent of meeting, and have them take their place there with you. I will come down and talk with you there, and I will take some of the spirit that is on you and put it on them, and they shall bear the burden of the people along with you so that you will not bear it all by yourself. And say to the people, consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, and you shall eat meat. For you have wailed in the hearing of the Lord, saying, if only we had meat to eat, surely it was better for us in Egypt. Therefore the Lord will give you meat, and you shall eat. You shall eat not only for one day or two days, or five days or ten days or twenty days, but for a whole month, until it comes out of your nostrils and becomes loathsome to you, because you have rejected the Lord who is among you, and have wailed before him, saying, Why did we ever leave Egypt? But Moses said, The people I am with number 600,000 on foot, and you say, I will give them meat, and they may eat for a whole month? Are there enough flocks and herds to slaughter for them? Are there enough fish in the seas to catch for them? The Lord said to Moses, Is the Lord's power limited? Now you shall see whether my word will come true for you or not. Okay, there's two stories woven together here. One is about a personal crisis for Moses, which triggered a meat crisis for Moses. Together, these two stories call into question some of the most basic things we've been taught to believe, specifically about weakness. Of course, we don't like to talk about weaknesses, but at least not our own. I'm happy to talk about yours all you want. You know, mine prefer to leave that in the shadow if you don't mind. We would rather focus on our strengths, wouldn't we? I mean, that's what successful people do. They focus on their strengths. And there's lots of people who will tell you that is what you should do. But there's another way to go about life. One of the many hats that I wear is I'm a, um, a certified coach for a program called Natural Church Development. 
And natural church development is a process that churches go through that are trying to grow. They're trying to kind of uh, re transform themselves from, from a declining church into a growing church. And the premise is that you score your church in eight key areas. And a lot of coaches now would say, find your strongest, focus on that, and you'll grow. You know, do what you do even better. But natural church development comes along and says, if one of these eight areas is a critical weakness for you, you better focus on that or you will never grow. Think about these eight key areas, and they're things like education, worship, spirituality, uh, even administration and facility, you know, the building. If each of these eight areas were the, the staves of a barrel, that's the, you know, the wood that, that goes along the side there, if one of them is lower than the others, you're only going to fill the barrel up that far. If you want to fill the barrel up further, then you've got to lengthen that stave so it will hold more water. That's the whole premise of natural church development. So it's all about focusing on your weakness so you can in increase capacity. Kind of hard to argue with it when you look at it that way, isn't it? But we were so programmed to equate weakness with failure, that we hide our struggles. We hide our needs, even from ourselves, even when we're hemorrhaging. Now, I know some of you volunteer at the gathering place and clinic with a heart. If you have, you've met people who are embarrassed to be there. Circumstances in their lives reached a point where they couldn't take care of their families, they couldn't pay their bills, they couldn't put food on the table. They couldn't afford dental care. Many put off coming as long as they possibly could because it was like admitting that they had failed that, and they felt ashamed. No one wants to be seen as a failure. No one wants to be thought of as weak. I mean, we want to be seen as capable and qualified. Uh, so we kind of live with this Apollo myth. You know, Apollo was that guy who had the whole world on his shoulders. We are raised thinking that successful people can carry all of our responsibilities on our own shoulders. We don't need any help. We don't have to rely on anybody else to carry anything for us. We can do it. We're strong. Now, many of us have been raised with that myth. But it's a myth we can't afford to believe anymore. Because when we believe that we have to do it all, or when we buy into uh, the role of responsible, uh, responsible adult to the point that we think everything depends on us and it's a sign of weakness to ask for help, then we've set ourselves up for failure. Our lives are just too complicated for us to handle everything by ourselves. I mean, think about it. Imagine yourself at the center of a circle, and, and all around you are all the people and all the responsibilities in your life. And so you have, you have strings that connect you to your spouse and your kids and your, your work, your parents, your pets. Uh, let's not forget housework, yard work. There's the, the community groups you're a part of, your, your church and your friends, and of course, a huge rope to your own expectations for yourself. Now imagine everybody's pulling on their ropes all at once. There is no way in the world you could meet everybody's expectations of you or yours of yourself at the same time. It is impossible. But everybody wants a piece of our time. Everybody wants a piece of our energy. They all need us. And no one, no one can fill that need except you. Is it any wonder that sometimes we lose our temper or that we just want to run away? I mean, do you think you might have an idea of how Moses felt? I mean, Moses, I feel for the guy. He was, he was pulled from his sheep and he was sent to Egypt to free a group of ungrateful slaves, lead them into the wilderness to a place he'd never been before. And soon after leaving Egypt, the complaints start. It's like, are we there yet? Where's the food? Where's the water? What's this manna stuff? We're tired of that. We want meat. One complaint after another. And of course, 
in the midst of everybody complaining about food, Aunt May's cow gets into Mr. Gray's chicken coop and kills all the chicken, just tramples them to death. And now Aunt May is going to Moses saying, I want you to make this right. She expects Moses to get justice for her. You see, Moses was the local magistrate, the mayor, the city planner, the engineer, the guide, the police force, the military strategist, and even their protector when God got angry at them. That's a lot. Now, once again, they're complaining. When they didn't like something, they piled their complaints on Moses. I mean, he's the leader. Isn't that what you do? You don't like something? It's the leader's fault and the leader's responsibility to fix it. Well, they piled all of their complaints and all of their petty arguments, all of their griping on Moses. And Moses simply couldn't handle it anymore. Well, in this story, they had gotten tired of a steady diet of manna, even though manna was the gift God gave them the last time they complained about not having food. Every morning they would wake up and there was this white stuff on the ground. Uh, the word manna literally means, what is it? Uh, but they would gather it up and it would be this, they could make this strange kind of a bread out of it. It was food. It was nourishment for them. God made sure every morning there was food there for them to eat. Well, apparently they were tired of eating it day after day after day. So they complained to Moses again. Like Moses could magically wave his hand and produce meat for them. Well, Moses is tired. He's frustrated. He's been carrying all the weight of responsibility all by himself for all these people ever since they left Egypt. And it's finally become too much for him. And he snaps. He yells at God. He actually asks God to let him die. Kill him. Get him out of his misery. Bottom line, he just couldn't handle it anymore. Now, there are those who would call Moses weak. But he wasn't. He was simply human. I had someone tell me once that uh, when I was feeling pretty much like Moses, that she thought I was stronger than that. Right? Well, you know, at first that hurt because I thought I was stronger than that too. I felt like a failure and she just confirmed everything I was feeling. But you know, then I got mad because who was she to tell me that I had to carry the weight of that church all by myself? I got mad. When people put that kind of pressure on us, they're asking us to be superhuman. And we don't have to be superhuman. We were never meant to carry the weight of the world on our shoulders. We don't have to solve every problem. And the success or failure of any venture does not depend on us alone. As someone once said to me, the job of Savior is already taken. Stop applying for it. When we start to believe that we have to be the Savior or we have to do everything without help, that we have to be strong, then we need help. We have believed that big lie that to ask for help is a sign of weakness. But you know, there will come a day when we can't handle it. We may not snap like Moses we may simply feel put upon, frustrated, resentful, helpless. But someday it's going to catch up with us. In Matthew's gospel, Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. When was the last time you asked for help? You know, most of us have too many responsibilities, too many demands on us. But that doesn't stop people from expecting more from us. They do. Many of us are finding that we're expected to do the same work today that three people did 20 or 30 years ago. I've certainly seen that in the church. The, the role that I have in the church today wasn't even dreamed of when I started in ministry 30 years ago. 
I mean, that's just the way the world has gone for all of us. Our schedules are too full. We have way too many expectations on us than one person can reasonably fulfill. And yet we are expected to handle everything from routine expectations to pandemics with grace and finesse. Why do we believe that lie? Why do we repeat it to ourselves over and over and over again? And why do we let it knock us down when someone else tells us we should believe that lie? What's wrong with asking for help? So what if others think we're weak? That's their problem, not ours. We were never meant to face life alone. We were never meant to carry the world on our shoulders. Adam and Eve, they were made to be helpers for each other. Moses was given Aaron as his partner. Jesus sent the disciples out in pairs. He didn't send them out all by themselves. The apostles even enlisted help in caring for others when, when, the, the, um, when the needy, uh, when the widow, <laughs> yeah. That's what happens when you know a story too well, you forget it. Um, the apostles enlisted help when they were faced with another need in their community. And they said, you know, we already have this responsibility over there. So... Let's find someone else to take on this new responsibility. You know, they couldn't do it all. and They didn't even try. They were smarter than us. So why do we think we're stronger or more responsible than they were? We do have a high opinion of ourselves, don't we? Unfortunately, we've believed the lie for so long that by the time we realize we do need help, we're almost beyond the point where help will help. We don't know what help to ask for. By then, we may be ready to walk out the door and never come back, quit our jobs, or say, God, take me now. That's where Moses was. He was mad at the Israelites for their chronic complaints. He was mad at the world for its unreasonable expectations of him, and he was mad at God for putting him there in the first place. Now, God could have responded in three ways, one of three ways. God could have been mad at Moses for failing in his duty to meet the needs of the people. God could have taken pity on Moses and granted his request, let him die right there in the wilderness. Or God did what God does best. God heard Moses' underlying cry for help and answered. We have to trust God that when we don't even know what to ask for, God will give us what we need. In Moses' case, he didn't need to escape. He just needed others to share the burden of leadership with him. So God said, Moses, take a breath. Take a breath. Go find 70 people who are good leaders. You've got them out there. Let's get them on board. Now, if you're wondering why God didn't offer this suggestion earlier, surely God knew where Moses was headed. Well, isn't it true that sometimes we can't accept help until we reach the end of the line, the end of the rope? And even then, sometimes we aren't ready to ask or accept. And that's because we have believed another big lie, which is that God won't give us more than we can handle. Can't tell you how many times I've heard that. Only it's not in the Bible, nowhere. What is in the Bible, though, is that God doesn't give us more than we can handle with God's help. Important three words, with God's help. We were never meant to be lone rangers or Apollo carrying the weight of the world on our shoulders alone. So ask for help, even if you don't know what you need. You know, that time I found myself caring more than I could handle, well, when I finally asked for help, I really wasn't sure what help I needed or what I could reasonably expect. But fortunately, I had a group of wise people around me who saw what was needed and helped me figure it out. Now, I didn't get 70 volunteers, but I got enough. The best thing about it, though, 
once I dealt with my weakness, which was believing that I had to do it all by myself, that I had to be the capable one, I had to have all the answers and know all the right things to do, once I got rid of that unrealistic expectation of myself, then I was able to focus on my strengths and grow. So what weakness holds you back from growing? What weakness holds you back from fulfilling the unique role that God has called you to in this world? What lie have you believed that is crushing you and stopping you from being strong? And what will it take you to stop believing the lie and ask for help? Jesus said, come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So often we think of this scripture when we're tired and needing a break. We forget that Jesus tells us there's actually still work to be done. There's still a role for us to fulfill. O only his, his work and, and his yoke, his load, is shared. It's light because it's shared. And when we share the load, when we help others with their load and they help us with ours, everyone benefits and everyone can do more. But it begins in that hard, hard place by acknowledging that we can't do it all. And for those who say that makes us weak, you know, well, just remember, we follow the one who said, my power is made perfect in weakness. And the one whom the world crucified, whom the world deemed weak, was the one who defeated death and gave life to us all. Friends, let us lay down our burdens before the one who can lift them up. God, we have believed the lies of the world that we are weak if we need help. We have to be strong and independent and pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps. Those lies crush us. And as long as we believe them, we will never fully be the people you created us to be. We will never fully embrace the life you call us to. And we will never discover the joy of living. Forgive us for our arrogance and forgive us for our fears that Feed those lies. Take the yoke from our shoulders that we might carry yours instead. Amen.
it is always appropriate to bring our needs to God and ask for God's help to lift our burdens and to give thanks for the joys that lighten every load. If we can help you do that through prayer, please let us know. You can email us. You can text us. You can even go to our website now and go to our prayer chapel under the Get Connected tab. Let us know how we could pray for you that your burdens might be light, uh, lighter. Let us pause to breathe and center ourselves on God. Eternal God, we rejoice today in the gift of life, which we have received by your grace and the new life you give in Jesus Christ. We come as people who know what it is to carry heavy loads and how hard it is to ask for help. And so in this moment of prayer, we pause to give thanks for those who have stepped up to help, even when we didn't know we needed it. We pause to give thanks for the love of our families, the support of our friends, strengths and abilities to serve your purpose, this community in which we live, and opportunities to give as we have received, knowing that in our giving, we just may help someone else who is feeling the weight of responsibility. God of grace, we offer our prayers for the needs of others and commit ourselves to serve them even as we have been served in Jesus Christ. We pause to remember those who are overwhelmed by the burden of leadership, those who are exhausted from navigating uncertainty and change, those who are ill and their caregivers, those who are in need of courage to move forward, Merciful God, you call us to journeys where we cannot see the destination, by paths untrodden, through perils unknown. Give us faith to go out with courage, not knowing where we go, but only that your hand is leading us and your love supporting us. This we dare to pray boldly in the name of Christ who taught us to pray, by saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Timing is everything. I talked about Clinic with a Heart and the people who come to that during the sermon. And just this week, we got a thank you note from Clinic with a Heart. And they shared the story of one of the women who has been going to the clinic for, for a decade. Her name is Zaloris. She's a 53-year-old year, single mother. And she's been going to the clinic for the past 10 years. She said that before she knew about the clinic with the heart, she found herself uh, facing one of those really difficult decisions that no one ever wants to face, which is, do I buy food for my kids or do I pay for my medicine? And she chose her kids. She ended up in the hospital when her heart went into AFib and had an extended stay there. Since hearing with Clinic with a Heart, she has attended their clinics, free clinics, twice a year. She's able to get all the food she needs for her family and all the medications she needs for herself. You know, burdens come in all shapes and sizes. As the people of God, as the body of Christ, we have the joyful calling to help lift those burdens, to help make life easier for those who are carrying way more weight than any one person ever should. We help through our gifts, through our prayers, through our hands-on service. We answer the call to help, even when the call is silent. So how is God calling you to help today? How is God calling you to use your gifts and your time and your resources to help lift somebody else's burden? 
don't underestimate the difference you can make. I think a lot of us do. We think we don't have much. We can't do much. But sometimes it doesn't take much to make a really big difference in someone else's life. We would love for you to join us in making a difference. You can give financially uh, through text or online or by mail. You can give of your time. You can give your service. If you aren't quite sure how, give us a call, let's talk, and we'll figure out where your passion meets someone else's need. But let's be one of those people who help, help lift the burdens of others so that they might flourish and bloom into the people that God has called them to be. Friends, may we leave this house strengthened by God's Holy Spirit. And may we be reminded that the body of Christ surrounds us to help us in our need. May the grace of God, the creator, the redeemer, and the sustainer go with you and lift you up always. Amen. Thanks for joining us at First Presbyterian Church, where faith is nurtured, curiosity encouraged, diversity welcomed, and all are loved. Find out more about us at fpclincoln.org or find us on Facebook.